everyone welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with molly if you are new around here if you have never seen my face on your screen before then hi my name is molly and i post true crime videos like this every single week so if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for then please do subscribe and don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that youtube will let you know whenever i post a new video this week we are going to be talking about the solved case of megan sharpton she was a young woman, a college student from Tennessee who was horrifically murdered in the summer of 2012. When Megan's body was found and a murder inquiry was launched by the police, they weren't really sure on suspects. There were a few people that they were looking at as possibly being the perpetrator until eventually they managed to piece this case together and collect evidence which pointed to one man and a sinister realisation that this crime was pre meditated this killer had carefully planned this brutal murder doing everything he could to get away with it just quickly before we get into the case please listen carefully to the following this video is about the murder of a young woman and involves heavy themes such as violence towards women sexual assault rape and suicide viewer discretion is advised so for this week's case we are going back to mid 2012 in the city of Tullahoma which is located in in Coffee and Franklin counties in Tennessee in the US. And this is Megan Sharpton. She was a 24 year old woman who lived in Tullahoma. Megan was born on the 24th of October 1987. Her full name was actually Erica Megan Sharpton, but clearly she went by her middle name for the most part, Megan. Megan was born to parents Kelly and Don. And according to sources, she had quite a few siblings. Her siblings are called Carrie, Alex, Will, Cameron, and Leah. And she also had grandparents and many cousins too. So she came from a big family. Unfortunately, I couldn't find much information online about Megan's upbringing. So as far as I'm aware, she had a pretty normal, happy childhood. I couldn't find any information which suggested otherwise. And at 24 years old, she was described as being a very kind and caring person. Her sister Carrie said that Megan was compassionate. She was genuine. She was a lot of fun to be around. Harry and Meghan were very, very close. They had a really special sister bond. Meghan was also described as being a very reliable person. She was the kind of girl that you could always count on and she was always looking out for others. No matter who they were, she was always there for other people. She had such a big heart. Meghan had moved out by the time this case occurred. She was no longer living with family because she had moved in with her boyfriend. His name was Chris Ferrell and he was about a year or so older the Megan and they had been together for a pretty long time, about three to four years. And Megan was also a full-time student. She was in nursing school because she had decided that she wanted to be a nurse when she was older. That was the career path that she wanted to go down, which I'm sure due to her loving and caring nature, she would have been amazing at. And so when she left normal school, she went on to go to nursing school to get her degree in nursing. And she had been in nursing school for a good few years by the time this case took place. In fact, I think she only had like a couple of months left before she graduated and was fully qualified. So she had started the process of looking into different nursing jobs and applying for interviews, etc. It was a really exciting time in her life. She had spent the last few years working so hard, studying so hard, and now she was about to enter the next chapter of her life. She was about to begin her career. However, it was a chapter that Megan would never get to see because in early July of 2012, her life was tragically and very suddenly cut short when she became the victim of a brutal crime. The date was the 1st of July 2012. It was a Sunday and that evening, Megan was due to go to her mum at Kelly's house for some dinner. I believe this was a bit of a tradition for the Sharpton family. Every single Sunday, Kelly's kids would go to her house and she would cook for them. So that was Megan's plan for that evening. She was going to go to her mum's, although she ultimately ended up cancelling quite suddenly because she had recently been offered a job interview for around that time. So she wasn't going to make it to her mum's in time for dinner. But she told her family that she would go to the interview and then she would come to her mum's afterwards or a little bit later that day. So they were expecting to see her. However, they were waiting and waiting for Megan to eventually arrive, but she never did. She never did come to her mum's house. The family didn't really think too much 
much of it at the time. They just assumed that something else had come up and that Megan was busy and they thought that they would just see her the next day instead. They didn't think that anything was wrong. Little did they know at the time that actually they would never see Megan alive again. And just hours after this, the dead body of a young woman was found. In the early hours of the morning, on the 2nd of July 2012, at approximately 1.18am, some motorists who were driving along Awalt Road in Franklin County decided to pull over and stop the car when they spotted a pretty big fire on the side of the road. So they got out of their car and they walked over to it to see what it was that was actually on fire and it was then when they realised that it was a body there was a dead human body within the flames. So horrified, they immediately picked up the phone and called for emergency services who quickly rushed to the scene. And when the fire department came and they put out the fire, it was pretty clear to the police straight away that foul play had been involved in this person's death. This, of course, was no natural death. The victim was a young woman, as I said. She was partially nude. She was wearing a shirt which seemed to have, like, a nursing school logo on it but apart from that she was naked she was naked from the waist down which immediately indicated that she had probably been the victim of a sexual assault in fact one thing the investigators noticed was that the fire was mainly situated around that area of her body around her pelvic area it looked like an accelerant had been poured directly onto this area perhaps in an attempt to try and destroy any evidence of sexual assault in terms of her cause of death another thing detectives noticed right away was some injuries to her head. It was clear that she had been beaten around the head, suggesting that her cause of death was blunt force trauma. In fact, the detective said that when they touched her head, they could feel broken bones. They could feel that her skull was basically shattered. That's how badly she had been beaten. However, later in her autopsy, it was determined that blunt force trauma wasn't the only thing which contributed to her death. This young woman had also sustained a gunshot wound. She had been shot in the face as well as beaten, and it's believed that the thing she was probably beaten with was the gun that shot her, the butt of the gun. And the reason the detectives didn't notice the gunshot wound when they first arrived at the crime scene was because of the fire. There was black soot on her face which covered it up. The autopsy also confirmed what the police initially theorised. This woman had indeed been sexually assaulted and the medical examiner determined that she was already dead when her body was set on fire because there was no soot in her lungs. She hadn't been breathing in the smoke. They estimated her time of death to have been about an hour and a half before her body was discovered and it's believed that she was probably shot and killed elsewhere and then her body was taken to this roadside and set on fire very shortly before those motorists drove by and called 911. So now the local police department had a murder inquiry on their hands and obviously the first thing they needed to do, their top priority, was to identify this poor woman. However, it seemed as though this was going to be difficult because there was nothing on her or at the scene which could tell them her name. So like she didn't have a phone on her or a purse or any kind of ID. Although something they did notice about this woman was that she had a couple of tattoos. She had this magnolia leaf tattoo and also a couple of tattoos of stars behind each of her ears. So the police thought, okay, maybe we can use these to try and find out who she is by releasing this information about her tattoos to the public and putting it on social media media obviously in the hopes that someone would recognize them and come forward and someone did. A woman got in touch with the detective saying that her daughter matched the description of the young woman that had been found dead right down to the star tattoos behind her ears. This woman that came forward was Kelly Sharpton and her daughter Megan was the one who had star tattoos. It seemed as though this victim was Megan and eventually 
Finally, this was confirmed. Megan Sharpton was the deceased victim that had been found dead. She had been brutally murdered at just 24 years old. And now that they had identified her, the hunt was on to find the person responsible, to find the twisted individual that had done this to Megan. So to begin their investigation, the police spoke at length with those closest to Megan, her family, to find out what her last known movements were. And the family obviously told the police what we've already discussed, that Megan was supposed to be going to a last minute job interview the evening before her body was found, and that she planned to go to her mum's house afterwards, but she never showed up, and they didn't hear from her either. She didn't ring them to let them know that she wasn't coming. Now, Megan had a car, and she would have driven herself to wherever this job interview was being held. However, after her body was found, the police realised that her car was missing. It wasn't in the same location as where her body was discovered, so the police needed to find it. And so they put out a bolo, a be on the lookout alert, so that other police departments knew to keep an eye out for this specific vehicle. And thanks to this, it wasn't long before it was found. Megan's car was discovered parked in an area which was about 15 to 20 miles away from the location where her body was found. And it almost looked as though it had just been abandoned for some reason. I don't believe there was anything wrong with the car. It wasn't like it had broken down and so Megan was forced to abandon it here. And there were also no signs of a struggle in the car, no blood or anything. So it was unclear exactly what had happened, why Megan had or someone else had left her car here. As I said, everything looked pretty normal inside the vehicle. Nothing really jumped out to the police as being unusual. Although they did find something in there which they thought might have been of interest. It was a slip of paper with Megan's handwriting on it and on this paper it appeared as though she had written down some directions on how to get to an address, perhaps the address to where her job interview was being held that evening. Although when the police looked further into this address they discovered something very strange. It didn't actually exist. These directions seem to be fake. Someone had given Megan directions to a fake place, which immediately made alarm bells ring. Perhaps the person who gave her this fake address was her killer, and they gave her these fake directions as a ploy to lure her to her death. Maybe they link back to the job interview. Perhaps the job interview itself was fake. Meanwhile, as all of this was going on, other detectives were still speaking a lot to Megan's family members members, her mum and her siblings. They were taking down details of Megan's life, finding out who was in her life, trying to determine whether the man who killed her was a stranger or whether it was someone that she knew personally. And the detectives asked her family straight up, is there anyone you can think of that could have been the killer? And Megan's sister Carrie immediately said, yeah her boyfriend, Chris Farrell. And the reason Carrie thought this was because she knew that Megan and Chris's relationship had been on the rocks for a while now. They did not have the best relationship. They argued a lot. They often had disagreements and they were just very much on again, off again constantly. Megan was not happy in the relationship anymore. She and Chris were just growing apart from one another and it seemed to be nearing the end. So quickly, Chris became the first and I guess number one suspect for the police. So the police went to speak to Chris and he seemed to be very, very upset about his girlfriend's death. They asked where he was on the night that Megan was killed and he said that he was at work. He worked the evening slash night shift at a local department store. He said that he was aware that Megan had planned to go to a job interview the evening before her body was found. And Chris actually told the police that Megan had told him that a girl she had gone to nurse school with had actually recommended her for this job and he believed the girl's name was Naomi. He couldn't recall her last name but he believed that her first name was Naomi. The police spoke to Chris about his relationship with Megan. They asked if it was a good relationship, were there any issues between them etc and he did say that they had had some rough patches in their relationship. I think at first he was kind of trying to downplay it but then eventually he said yeah 
yeah, it wasn't great. It wasn't very healthy. They would argue often. It seemed as though they may have wanted different things in life and that they didn't have the same vision for their futures. Megan was very much a career-focused person, whereas Chris wasn't so much, and it appears as though that was something that they had arguments about often. But whilst he did admit that their relationship was rocky and not always a happy one, he completely denied having anything to do with Megan's murder. Chris said that he never would have done anything to hurt Megan. But of course, the police couldn't rule him out just yet. They were going to keep looking into him as a suspect, but he wasn't the only one. Another man the detective started looking into was Robbie Rosa, and he was, I believe, a friend and roommate of Chris and Megan's. He lived in their house with them. Robbie was asked to come down to the police station to answer some questions about Megan's case because, of course, the police were planning to speak to all of the men in Megan's life. And when they spoke to Robbie, he actually confessed something to the police. He, like Chris, also said that he was not responsible for Megan's death. However, Robbie told them that he and Megan had actually started seeing each other behind Chris's back. Like I mentioned, Chris and Megan were basically coming to the end of their relationship. They were growing apart from each other and Megan had started to develop feelings for their roommate, Robbie. She liked him as more than just a friend. And Robbie, felt the same and they began seeing each other. So could this have been a motive for Chris? Did he find out about Robbie and Megan's secret relationship and decide to kill Megan for cheating on him? Or could Robbie have been the killer? Did he and Megan have some kind of argument because Megan, I don't believe, had officially broken up with Chris and Robbie was angry about this so he carried out her murder? The police had two men here, two people in Megan's life that now may have had a motive for committing this horrific crime and they're still trying to figure out if either of them were responsible and if so which one of them so they had both chris and robbie undergo a polygraph test now obviously a lie detector test isn't solid evidence at all they are inadmissible in a court of law but the police still wanted chris and robbie to do one to give an indication on whether or not one of them could be lying about their involvement so they sat them down, conducted the two tests, and both men passed it. Both Chris and Robbie passed the polygraph, which indicated that they were telling the truth. And following this, eventually, both men were more or less eliminated as suspects. The detectives were able to confirm Chris's alibi. They were able to confirm that he was at work at the time that Megan was killed. And they were pretty sure that Robbie was innocent of this crime too. They did not believe he was the murderer. So they were basically ruled out, not fully ruled out, but for the time being, as I said, the detectives felt confident that neither of them were Megan's killer. And so the search for the real killer continued. One line of inquiry that the detectives were still trying to follow up on and find out more about was this supposed job interview that Megan said she was going to on the evening she was killed. They wondered if perhaps it could have been related to the case. Like we talked about earlier, the police found those directions to a fake address in Megan's car. Maybe that address was where she had been told the job interview was being held. Maybe the job interview was fake, just like the directions, and the killer just made it up to lure Megan to where her car was found abandoned, and from there they abducted her. Now, as I mentioned, Megan's boyfriend, Chris, said that the girl who recommended Megan for this job interview was called Naomi. So the police needed to find this Naomi and find out more. They obviously knew from Chris again that Naomi was someone who went to nursing school with Megan and so the detectives started going through the nursing school student records for all the Naomi's that had gone there and they discovered that there was one woman in Megan's class called Naomi Jones. They got a hold of Naomi's address and a detective went straight to her house to speak with her although she wasn't actually home 
at the time. However, a neighbor was able to give the detectives Naomi's number and so they spoke with her on the phone instead. They started asking Naomi some questions. They asked her about this job interview that Naomi had recommended Megan for. And bizarrely, Naomi actually said to the detective, I have no idea what you're talking about. She said that she never recommended Megan for any job interview. She even said to the detectives, me and Megan were not close at all. I mean, she said that they shared a ride together to nursing clinical classes a couple of times. There were a few occasions where her husband drove both of them to classes, but that was the extent of their relationship. They weren't friends. They just knew of each other. They were classmates. And so, yeah, Naomi said that she wouldn't have recommended Megan for an interview. And that was all she could tell the police. She didn't seem to be able to provide any answers. If anything, it just left them with more questions. Because why had Megan told Chris that Naomi had recommended her for this interview if she hadn't? Two days after Megan's body was discovered, on the 4th of July 2012, the detectives received information that some of Megan's belongings had been found, belongings that she had with her on the day that she was killed. A man who was fishing on a nearby creek that day discovered a purse floating in the water and inside of this purse was a social security card and a driving license and the name on this license was Megan Sharpton. This was Megan's purse. It seemed as though this was another attempt by her killer to get rid of evidence. He threw Megan's purse into this creek because he didn't want it to be found. So the purse was collected as evidence and the investigation continued. Megan's friends and family of course eager to do anything they could to help with the investigation and find her killer decided to raise money for a reward for anyone with information which could lead to the arrest of her murderer and as time went on rumors and speculation started to circle around the area people started to theorize that perhaps Megan wasn't this killer's first victim. Perhaps her case was connected to the case of another young woman, another nursing student actually, a girl named Holly Bobo. Holly was just 20 years old when she disappeared in April of 2011 in Dardine in Tennessee, which is about a two hour and 40 minute drive away from Tullahoma. Holly was a missing person for quite a few years until 2014 when her remains were found and it was concluded that she had tragically been murdered. But obviously Megan's murder occurred just the year after Holly disappeared in 2012. So people started to think that maybe the cases were linked. Maybe the person who killed Megan was the same person who was responsible for Holly's disappearance just the year before. And the detectives thought that this could be a possibility too. They thought that the cases could have been connected. And so they started looking more into this, trying to find evidence which linked them. Them. But ultimately it was determined that Megan and Holly's cases were not linked in any way. They didn't share the same murderer. Both cases are now solved and different people were responsible. So that was another line of inquiry that seemed to lead nowhere unfortunately. But then just a couple of weeks after Megan's death there was a new development in the case. When Megan's boyfriend Chris got in touch with the detectives saying that he had found something that he thought might have been of use used to them. It was Megan's old phone. Now her current phone, the one that she had at the time of her death, was actually missing. It seemed as though the killer had stolen it from her after her murder and so far it hadn't been found. The police hadn't been able to locate it. It wasn't in her purse in the creek and it wasn't in her car. But Chris was able to give police this older phone of Megan's and he told them that this was actually the phone that Megan had been contacted on about the job interview and he found the number on the phone records which he believed was the number that had called her offering her the job interview. So the police took this old phone and they began trying to trace the number and what they discovered was that this number that had called Megan about the job interview 
came from a burner phone, which was another thing which, again, seemed to point to the theory that the interview Megan had been offered was completely fake. The directions were fake, the interview was fake, and the killer had used a burner phone to contact Megan and lure her to her death in the hopes that it wouldn't be traced back to them, which just shows you how premeditated this was. The killer, whoever they were, had spent time carefully planning this crime. So this burner phone was the key to hopefully identifying the murderer, obviously because it was a burner phone, it wasn't registered with a name or at least a real name but the police were able to determine where it had been purchased from it had been brought from a local department store so they got in contact with this department store and they were able to tell the police that about 12 of these phones had been purchased from the store before and they were also able to give the police the store's cctv footage so the police went through the footage looking at all 12 people that had brought one of these phones and and when they did this, one of these people in particular caught the detective's attention the most. It was a young man buying the phone and the reason he kind of struck the police as odd was because they could see on the footage his own cell phone out on the counter. So he was buying a phone when he already had a phone. Did he intend to use this one he bought as a burner phone? Was this the man that killed Megan Sharpton? After leaving the store the police spotted this man on another CCTV camera in the parking lot walking towards a red pickup truck and another thing that they noticed was that he seemed to park in a space farthest away from the store as he could maybe because he thought that that way he would be out of view of cctv cameras and now that they had the footage of this man buying what the police believed was the burner phone the detectives took pictures of him from the footage and they began i believe just showing it to other police officers and circulating it around other police departments asking anyone if they recognized him and as luck would have it someone did the detectives were informed that the man on cctv was a local drug dealer named timothy gifford so timothy was asked to come down to the police station for an interview and they straight away confronted him with the cctv footage of him buying the barna phone and they basically said to him something along the lines of look this does doesn't look good for you. We've got you on video buying the phone that we believe Megan Sharpton's killer used to lure her to her death. It looks to us like you are the perpetrator. But Timothy denied it. He said that he was not the one responsible for Megan's death. He said that he didn't even know who Megan was. However, he did admit to buying the burner phone. He admitted that yes, that was him on the department store CCTV footage. But he claimed that he was sent to the department store about a month before Megan's death to buy the phone for someone else and that someone was a man named Donnie Jones and this was not the first time the detectives had heard this name. Donnie Jones was known to the police because he was actually a police informant and he had a lengthy criminal record. He'd been to prison I think a number of times before for crimes such as theft, drug related offences, he'd been accused of sexual assault and rape before and obviously as we know Megan Sharpton was sexually assaulted by her killer so Donnie was the kind of person that the police were looking for but it wasn't just his criminal history and the statement from Timothy Gifford which pointed to Donnie as being a potential suspect. You see as the police continued looking into him they discovered that Donnie Jones was actually married to Naomi Jones. Naomi, Megan's former classmate at nursing school and the woman that Chris said had recommended Megan for the job interview. So this is all slowly starting to add up now. As the police continued speaking to Timothy Gifford, they discovered that the red pickup truck that Timothy drove to the department store to buy the burn phone actually belonged to Donnie Jones. And Timothy told the detectives that just days after Megan Sharpton's murder, Donnie had actually meticulously cleaned that truck and he'd even replaced a load of the interior like the carpet for example. He ripped up the old carpet and put down a new one 
perhaps in an attempt to get rid of evidence relating to Megan's murder. And then after this, he actually got rid of the truck. He gave it away to Timothy's brother, I believe. Evidence was really starting to mount against Donny Jones. It was all circling back to him. The burner phone, the truck, the fake job interview, the fact that he was married to the woman who had supposedly recommended Megan for this job interview. It really was starting to look like he was the man the police had been looking for. He was Megan Sharpton's killer. So after receiving the statement from Timothy, which implicated Donnie, the police went to Donnie's address to speak with him, and he immediately denied having any involvement in Megan's murder. He said that he hardly knew Megan. He obviously knew of her through his wife, but he didn't know her well at all. He denied asking Timothy Gifford to buy the burner phone for him, and he said that on the night of Megan's murder, he he was just at home with his children. I think he had three children and he said that he was looking after them that evening. But to be honest, that wasn't a strong enough alibi for the police at all because, I mean, he could have just left the house whilst the kids were sleeping to commit this murder. So his alibi was unable to rule him out. They conducted a search of his house to see if they could find any evidence in there, but they didn't really, they didn't find anything in there that linked to the crime. The police seized Donnie's old truck, the red pickup truck, and it was sent off to forensics to be searched. However, again, nothing was really found, I don't believe. But they did confirm that, yes, it had recently been thoroughly cleaned. It was literally like a brand new truck on the inside. And they also asked Donnie if they could take some samples of his DNA, which he agreed to. He said yes. And then these samples were sent off for testing because the police had obtained Megan's killer's DNA. The killer's semen was found on her body from where she had been raped so Donnie's samples were sent off for comparison and when the results came back it was just even more evidence against Donnie Jones because the DNA on Megan's body was a match to him an exact match so Donnie was brought in to the police station to be interviewed and the detectives didn't tell him about the DNA evidence straight away they decided to ask him a couple of questions first. So like they asked him, oh had you and Megan ever been in a relationship before? Had you ever had a one night stand with each other? To which he said no to both questions. They asked Donnie if he had seen Megan on the day that she died. Did he have any contact with her that day? And again he said no. And so it was then when the detective said to Donnie, okay well then explain to us why your DNA is present on her body. And apparently Donnie was very struck by this. He was very shocked. He lost his temper with the detectives a bit, I think. He got quite angry. And then shortly after this, he completely changed his story. So as I just said before this, he said that he had never been in an intimate relationship with Megan and that he did not see her on the day of her murder. But now that he had been confronted with this evidence, he decided to say that actually he did see her that day to try and explain the DNA evidence, he said that he did sleep with Megan on the day that she was killed. They had consensual sex, but he claimed that he was not the one who killed her. Someone else must have done that after they slept together. Of course, the police did not believe Donnie at all. They knew that this was a lie. They knew that he was the killer. But unfortunately, at the same time, they didn't quite have enough evidence just yet to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. They didn't have enough to charge him with the crime and so they were forced to release him for the time being whilst they continued searching for concrete evidence which linked him to the murder. So in an attempt to find more evidence the detectives decided to look more into the GPS tracking data on four different phones. Donnie's phone, the burner phone, Timothy Gifford's phone because I think by this point in the investigation they were still looking at Timothy as a potential suspect too. He had not been completely ruled out just yet. So yeah, Donnie's phone, the burner phone, Timothy's phone, and Megan's phone, which I believe still had not yet been found. But the police were still going to be able to look at her cell phone data to determine where the phone had been. They basically wanted to look at the data on these four phones to piece together where each one had been on the evening of Megan's murder. They wanted to see if any of the phones had been in the same location as Megan's because then 
that's proof that either Donnie or Timothy were with Megan on the evening she was killed. So they requested the GPS analysis data on all four phones, which they had to wait a couple of weeks for. It's not just an instant thing that they can get a hold of straight away, unfortunately. So yeah, all they could do for the time being was wait for the data to come back. However, whilst they were waiting, luckily they were able to arrest the top suspect, Donnie Jones, on other charges, completely unrelated to Megan's case. You see, the police actually found a rifle in the back of his car. It wasn't the same firearm that had been used to shoot Megan, but of course, because he had been to prison before, he was a convict, he wasn't allowed to own this weapon. And so he was arrested for possession of a firearm and sent back to prison, which I'm sure was such a huge relief for the detectives. At least now, whilst they continued building their case against him, they had peace of mind knowing that this very, very dangerous man, this suspected murderer, was off the street. And then not long after his arrest, finally, the phone data results had come in and it was exactly the breakthrough that the police needed in the case. The data from Timothy Gifford's phone showed that it was not in contact with the Barna phone or Megan's phone at all that night. So it was at this point when he was ruled out as a suspect in the case. But the data from the Burner phone and Donnie Jones's phone showed that on the evening that Megan was killed, the evening of the 1st of July 2012, both phones were in the same location. So that proved that Donnie had possession of both of them. He had the burner phone with him that night. The records also showed that the burner phone had been in contact with Megan's phone that evening. Megan had been on a call with someone with Donnie via the burner phone. It's believed while she was following the fake directions he had previously given her to this fake job interview. And then later that evening, the GPS data showed that the burner phone and Megan's phone were now in the same location. And that location was the area where her car was later found abandoned, where the police believe Megan was kidnapped from. Following this, the data from the phones showed that they went to a farmland area nearby. Donnie Jones's family owned a lot of farmland in Tennessee, so it's believed that Donnie took Megan to one of the farms. And then later that night, the GPS data also placed the phones at the location where Megan's body was eventually discovered. So this was solid evidence to further prove that Donnie was the killer because the police could now place him at each crime scene. They could place him with Megan that night. So just to piece this all together quickly, I'm going to run through what the police believed happened that night based on the GPS data and of course other evidence, the timeline of events. Well I say that night but I mean as I said previously all the evidence indicates that Donnie Jones had been planning this murder for a while before it actually happened. He got Timothy Gifford to buy the burner phone for him about a month before Megan's murder, he probably paid him to do that and it's thought that Donnie didn't necessarily pick Megan specifically specifically as being his victim. He didn't, I guess, have his sights set on her from the very beginning when he decided that he wanted to rape and murder someone. He was kind of looking for any young woman that he could lure to a certain place to kill them. In the weeks before Megan's murder, investigators discovered that Donnie Jones had used the burner phone to contact multiple young women in an attempt to find a victim. He was contacting women who were in the like care and healthcare line of work, nursing industry. And one of those women that he got in contact with was 24 year old Megan Sharpton. As we know, he knew of Megan because his wife Naomi went to the same nursing school as her. If you recall from earlier on in the video, I said that Naomi's husband even gave her and Megan a lift to nursing classes on a couple of occasions. So in the process of looking for his victim, it's believed that Donnie went through his wife contacts on her phone. He got Megan's number and he contacted her pretending that he was hiring for a nursing position and that his wife had recommended her. So he wanted to offer her an interview on the evening of the 1st of July 2012. He gave Megan these fake directions which she jotted down on that slip of paper but it's believed that while she was following 
these directions in her car that evening she called Donnie she called the burner phone because she was struggling to find the address obviously because the address did not actually exist so she was on the phone to him and he directed her to the location where her car was later found and obviously there he abducted her probably at gunpoint he then put Megan in his truck and he drove to one of his family's farms as shown on the phone data and it's believed that that is where the murder happened after raping Megan he beat her around the head and shot her in the face and when the police later searched this farmland they did actually find Megan's scarf this purple scarf with stars on that she had been wearing that evening was found in a burn barrel on the property which further proved that she had been there after Megan was dead it's believed Donnie put her in his red pickup truck and then in the early hours of the following morning he drove to that roadside along a walt road he carried her body out of the truck put her on the ground poured some kind of accelerant over her mainly over her pelvic area in an attempt to destroy the evidence of rape and then he set her body on fire got back in his truck and left and megan's body was found shortly after by those motorists that is what the detectives believed happened that night how this horrific crime unfolded and now that they had pieced this case together and they had obtained a substantial amount of evidence against him Donnie Jones was finally arrested and charged in relation to this crime on the 5th of November 2012 more than four months after Megan's death that Donnie Jones was charged with two counts of aggravated kidnapping as well as rape and first degree murder and given the fact that so far he had maintained his innocence he completely denied being Megan's killer it was looking like this case was headed to trial however it didn't in the end because ultimately donny jones decided to plead guilty and as i understand it he only did this because he had come to a deal with prosecutors whereby he agreed to confess to the murder and plead guilty as long as they agreed not to seek the death penalty he didn't want to be on death row so he pleaded guilty and on the 4th of february 2013 donny jones received a life sentence sentence he was given life without the possibility of parole so he will most likely be in prison until the day that he dies thank goodness in the aftermath of this case a seven foot tall star sculpture was created and placed at the site where megan's body was discovered on a walt road as a memorial for her from what i can gather megan absolutely loved stars as we know she had those star tattoos behind each of her ears she had a purple star scarf which had been gifted to her by her sister so a star sculpture seems incredibly fitting as a tribute to her the sculpture has 24 stars on it one for each year of Megan's life but sadly Megan's horrific murder was not the only tragedy that the Sharpton family were faced with because just the year following her death Megan's mother Kelly sadly passed away Kelly Sharpton took her own life on the 8th of November 2013 just eight months after her daughter's killer was sentenced to life in prison articles state that Kelly just couldn't cope with the pain of losing her child in such a brutal and violent way it was just too much for her to bear so in a way Donny Jones took two lives he didn't just kill Megan he killed Kelly too because Kelly could not live without her she couldn't live with the knowledge of what Megan Megan had gone through. I actually read on one article that after her daughter's death, Kelly said that every single morning she would wake up and the first thing she would see was her dead daughter's face. I cannot imagine just how much mental suffering Kelly was in, how much pain and trauma she endured as a result of what had happened to Megan. And my heart just aches for the rest of the Sharpton family because they lost two incredibly special people to them both in horrific circumstances an incredibly sad note to end on but that is it for this case that is the case of Megan Sharpton such an awful crime 
Johnny Jones is just a monster of a man and I'm glad that he will be spending the rest of his life behind bars because he definitely seems like the kind of killer that would re-offend and potentially become a serial killer if he hadn't been caught for this. But yeah, that is it for this case. As always, please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on the case in the comments down below. I would love to hear what you guys think. Also feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. Thank you all so so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you again next time for another mystery with Molly. Bye!